Do you remember when security wasn't a big time design concern? Yeah, I don't either. For today's IoT, IIoT, server and cloud computing applications, a proper security solution needs to be robust. It needs to include key protection, secured firmware updates, identity protection, and a whole lot more. But if you're looking to get your design off the ground quickly, how do you implement a robust security solution and not slow down your design process? Infineon's Optiga TPM, that's how. Hi, I'm Amelia Dalton, host of Chalk Talk. Security is a critical design concern for most electronic designs today. But finding the right security solution for your next design can be a complicated and time-consuming process. In this episode of Chalk Talk, Andreas Fuchs from Infineon and I investigate how Infineon's Optiga Trusted Platform Module can not only help solve your security design concerns, but also speed up your design process as well. And before we get started, don't forget to click that link. There you can find even more information about this topic from Infineon. Hi, Andreas. Thank you so much for joining me. Hello. Great to be here. Excellent. I'm excited to talk all about the Optiga TPM today. But before we dig into the details, Andreas, what all will we be covering today? First of all, I'm going to give a quick introduction about what a TPM actually is, and then I'll introduce the new chips that we brought to the market last year and the boards and the new software that come along with them this year and how you can use them to get started evaluating our product. Excellent. So first, Andreas, can you talk about what exactly a trusted platform module is? What does it do? So a trusted platform module is a security chip that can be incorporated into any kind of devices that offers a standardized solution for protecting communications, for protecting valuable data. And it's updatable if necessary and can be applied to all kinds of things such as factories, IoT, PC server, cloud computing, all application scenarios of IT technology. Security is a huge design concern these days. So how does the Optiga TPM help address these issues? The TPM provides a hardware-based route of trust for your device. And it's a security-certified hardware that has a very strong tamper-resistant functionality. And it can be used to protect your cryptographic keys, to protect your identities, to help against malware attacks, to secure firmware updates, to secure your communications. And it also comes with a hardware-based random number generator that gives a very good entropy source for all kinds of cryptographic operations. Okay, so Andreas, what kind of applications or markets is this solution a good fit for? It's a good fit for all kinds of markets that incorporate IT technology. We have several versions of the TPM. We have the 9672 based on the firmware 15 series that is mostly suited for the PC laptop, server, and cloud security market. Then we have the 9672 firmware 16 series, which is mainly targeted at cloud security, IoT, and smart factories. And the latest to the family is the 9673 with the firmware 26 series, which provides an I2C interface as opposed to the SPI interface of the former two, which is specifically designed for IoT networking and smart factory applications. So it allows the safe and secured connection and authentication between clients that connect to the cloud, but also for the servers and devices that are in the cloud when they connect to clients or management equipment. Also in the area of networking, it allows you to secure network equipment such as routers, switches, gateways, and to provide a safe way for rolling out updates and features to these devices. Also in factories, it will help you to establish trusted connections between control servers and the manufacturing devices and gives you remote update capabilities on your manufacturing floor. So Andreas, can you address the differences within this family? Of course. So we see that we have the 9670 on the very left here, that was the predecessor device. And since then, we've introduced the three new devices, 
that I just talked about. We see that, first of all, from the TCG standard, we are now supporting a newer revision, 159 as opposed to 138. And we drastically increased the NV, the non-volatile user memory that can be facilitated from 7 kilobytes to 51 kilobytes. Also, we've extended the cryptographic capabilities of the device. So now we introduced the capabilities for RSA 3K and RSA 4K. We also introduced the NIST P384 curve. And we also provide certificates for each of those cryptographic devices, especially for the IoT market. Furthermore, for the IoT specific versions for the firmware 16 and firmware 26, we made a few of the capabilities of the TPM configurable so that you can, for example, prevent a change EPS command or you can facilitate a unique ID for the TPM. The differences in communication between the different versions I already mentioned. So the standard versions are SPI based and the latest edition with the 96723 is now I2C based. Also very important, all of these products now come with PQC protected firmware updates, which means that when we as Infineon have to roll out a firmware update, this update is PQC protected, such that an attacker who was able to break pre-post quantum algorithms would not be able to all of a sudden own the complete fleet and the complete deployment of Infineon products. That's great. Now, Andreas, what about the evaluation boards for this TPM? Can we take a closer look at those as well? Absolutely. So with the new chips, we introduced the new evaluation boards that are specifically designed to fit on Raspberry Pis. As you can see here, they carry the TPM chip itself and then also capabilities to interact with it with the reset button or the GPIO headers that can be used in order to directly interact between the TPM and the physical world, for example, by attaching binary sensor or by also attaching a actuator to the security chip itself. So for the 9672 evaluation board, you see that the target market is for the IoT market. It features the SPI interface and it's compliant with the Raspberry Pi head standard. What this means is that the configurations that are needed in order to bring up this chip in a Raspberry Pi OS are written into an EEPROM that's on the board itself. So this means that you will have a plug and play experience when you connect this board to a Raspberry Pi and you boot up Linux, it will automatically configure the TPM device that's provided on the board and the Linux kernel will start using it. For the 9673, we have the same capabilities. The difference here is, of course, that we have the I2C standard, but again, we have the same capabilities of automatically configuring a Linux kernel based on the Raspberry Pi head standard in order to get the TPM device up and running. Also, as I already mentioned, the three GPIOs from the TPM for interacting with sensors and actuators are exposed. And you can see that on the picture on the top left side, the JP2, where these three GPIOs are brought out for usage. Andreas, you mentioned new software, right? Can we talk about that as well? Yes. So the first part of the software stack to talk to a TPM is the TPM embedded driver support. This comes on the one hand side for U-Boot and on the other hand side for the Linux kernel itself. For the 9672 series, the drivers for interacting with the TPM have long existed in the actual code base, and there is a tutorial on how to get this running posted on GitHub. For Linux, it's even easier. The driver itself has existed for many years now. And as I mentioned previously, the Linux kernel, when it comes from a Raspberry Pi OS, will automatically read out the EEPROM in order to activate this driver. Alternatively, it's a one-line entry into the config.txt file of your Raspberry Pi embedded Linux in order to activate this device tree. For the 9673, the driver support has been added more or less recently. For U-Boot, the driver was introduced with the U-Boot version 2022.07. So it was introduced in July of last year. And for the Linux kernel, it was introduced around the same time with Linux 6.0 that was released. There's also a patch set available that can be used in order to backport the I2C driver to older versions of Linux. Once you do so, as I mentioned, the device trees themselves are usually auto-configured and it will be a very pleasant out-of-the-box experience. 
There's also going to be a quick starter guide that is currently in development that will soon be released that will describe in very high detail how to set up the evaluation boards, how to set up the drivers, but also how to set up the whole system on uh, non-Raspberry Pi at standard compliant Linux kernels. So if you're attempting to run your own custom Linux distribution, it will tell you exactly how to do the backporting of the drivers and how to compile a compatible Linux kernel. So Andreas, do you have any use cases you can share with me and my audience? Of course. So beyond the driver, there's a wide variety of host software that supports the TPM right out of the box. The biggest part is, of course, the TPM software stack libraries. It's a middleware, it's uh, open sourced, it's packaged in, I guess, today almost, if not all Linux distributions, and it provides the basic control interfaces in order to talk to the TPM through the driver in the Linux kernel. On top of that, there is a set of applications that can be used, such as the TPM2 tools, which are a set of simple command line tools in order to talk to the TPM. But there's also other things such as open SSL engines that can be easily used. The whole development of the host software stack is driven by an open source effort. And there is user to user support, but also user to maintainer support available via the tpm2-software.github.io landing page where you can see a chat, mailing lists, some external resources and presentations that were given, as well as some tutorials. Beyond the projects directly provided here, there's also a lot of third-party application support. Most famously, Systemd and the Systemd Crypt Enroll recently gained support in order to support the TPM for disk encryption. Also, we have plugins for OpenSSL, for OpenSSL 111 and so on. There is the TPM2 TSS engine, and then for OpenSSL 3.0, where the API was changed from the engine API to the provider API, there is the TPM2 OpenSSL project. Both of these can be used in order to easily configure web servers or web clients to utilize the TPM for authenticated communication. Also, for other tools that rely on the PKCS11 standard, we do have an implementation of the PKCS11 module utilizing the TPM. And if you want to perform your own custom TPM applications and operations, then you can leverage the TPM2 tools, which is the command line tooling. And for example, come up with bash scripting in order to uh, execute certain commands. Or there's also Python bindings for the TSS that can be used in order to implement applications in Python against the TPM. We do have a set of application examples readily available on GitHub under the Infineon Optiga TPM namespace. And there will be regular updates in the future providing even more and more extended tutorials. Great. Okay. So Andreas, if my audience is ready to get started, where should they go for more information? Just scan those two QR codes you see here on screen and get your TPM evaluation kit, order it at Mauser and just plug and play and see where it takes you. I love it. Well, Andreas, I think that's all I have time for today. Thank you so much for joining me. Thank you. It was a pleasure. And before we go, you didn't forget to click that link, did you? There you can find even more information about this topic from Infineon. For Chalk Talks, I'm Amelia Dalton from eejournal.com. For more Chalk Talks, head on over to eejournal. You can't miss it. It's right across the top. Or check out YouTube, youtube.com slash eejournal.